Thanks for joining us today. We love to hear how God is using this ministry to impact your life. So share your story with us at info at fellowshipgj.com. And if God is using this ministry to impact you, we would like to encourage you to partner with us financially. You can do so online at fellowshipgj.com. Select the giving option that works best for you and help us bring the message of Christ to this community and beyond. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoy today's message. Well, good morning, church family. I want to wish you a happy new year and thank you so much for slipping and sliding on out here to church with us today. We're so glad you braved the weather and came out with us today because I believe um, God has something in store for us today. I believe he wants to speak to us clearly today. I'm excited about this because we're starting a brand new series called Water Walkers. And in this series, we're really going to be focusing on what it looks like for you and I to follow Jesus. What does a a life of faith look like? So um, I want to pray about this before we dive into it. Um, But today we're really going to kind of just have an overview of the whole month of what we're going to be talking about in the month of January and, and how you and I can walk out a life of faith. But would you pray with me before we dive in? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the snow. Uh, We've been praying that we need moisture and here you send it. So thank you so much, God. And I pray that you would meet with us right now. You've already met with us in this room as we've worshiped you. Uh, But as you're in this room now, I pray that you speak to us, that it wouldn't be my opinions, it wouldn't be my words, but God, as we get into your scripture and we hear your words, that you would use me as a mouthpiece today. And um, that God, we would just all be change and bless. Open our eyes to see you, God, and open our ears to hear um, the truth of what you want for our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I'm going to go ahead and dive in to a passage in scripture where we get the title of this series. And it's found here in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 25. It says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, immediately, the Bible says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Today, I want to speak to you from the subject, I am a water walker. In fact, to get you involved with me this morning, I want to go ahead and ask you, turn to the person sitting next to you, look them right in the eye, and tell them that. Make that declaration. Say, I am a water walker. I am a water walker. I need to ask you to get involved with me. I know it's snowing outside, and you're thinking about hot cocoa in your fireplace later, but I believe God wants to speak to us today. So I want to ask you to get involved. It's okay to talk back to me. It's okay to make some noise. We're just agreeing with what we want to see God do in our lives. See, I believe that this passage um, in Matthew 14 is not just a, a story. I believe that it is a picture of a principle that if you and I accept and embrace this principle, it can accelerate our lives. It can change our lives. It's a trampoline, if you will, that can can launch us into greater levels of, of, of the way we can live our lives. See, the principle that we pull from this passage is the principle of exception. The principle of exception. Someone say exception. Exceptions, let's try that again. I'm gonna talk to this side over here. Someone say exception. Exception, the principle of exception. Webster's Dictionary says this. It defines exception as a person or thing that is excluded from a general statement and does not follow a rule. Okay, so a person or a thing excluded from a general statement and does not follow a rule. So an exception is an anomaly, right? it's, It's a special case. It's a deviation from the normal. It's an irregularity. 
right? And I believe that this definition fits a description of the way that God seems to address his people. And it, in there, it seems like in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God seems to suggest that he expects his people, he expects you and I to be exceptions, to be the anomaly, to be a deviation from the norm, to be an irregularity from our social society. He expects us to be different. He uses words when he describes you and I, when he describes his people, he, words like salt, light. He calls us loved, he calls us chosen, beloved. He calls us special, set apart, anointed. He uses words like peculiar to describe his people. In church, that's not ordinary. That's normal. That, that's not normal. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary, right? We're empowered to be people of exception. Therefore, we have to embrace this principle of exception. And the principle of exception, I've got it on the side screens for you so you can follow along. This is the principle of exception. I hope you'll embrace this as we get into this series over the next couple of weeks, even today. And the principle of exception is this. What happens with others does not dictate and determine what happens with me. That's the principle of exception. I'm going to read that again because that was much better than your response. <laughs> what happens with others does not dictate and determine what happens with me. All right, that's the principle of exception. And do you realize that you can be the exception? You can be the exception to the normal. See, God's people are exceptions all throughout Scripture. We see it if we go all the way back to the book of Exodus. We see um, that God's people were in slavery. They were in, in the land of Egypt. And there in Egypt, we see that God begins to express this to us, that he makes us exceptions. Ex Exodus 8, 23 says, I will make a distinction between my people and your people. All right, that, that's what God speaks to Pharaoh. That's what he speaks to the people in Egypt. He's saying, look, I'm gonna make an exception between the way things work out for you and the way things work out for my people. And he, he's trying to get us to understand that just because things go a certain way for everyone else, that's not the way he expects it to go for you and I. And you need to hear that. Just because, oh, the economy's doing this and the economy's doing that and, and just because, you know, half of marriage is into divorce, just because of all these statistics we hear on TV, it's like, that's the way things go. And he goes, no, no, I'm gonna make a distinction between my people and your people. There is gonna be a difference. My people are the exception to the norm. And we see that this promise begins to be fulfilled even two chapters later in Exodus chapter 10. It says, um, and there's plagues coming along the land. And it says this, so Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky and total darkness covered all of Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days, yet all of Israel had light in the places where they lived. Did you catch that? Did you miss that? The entire country of Egypt was covered in darkness except for where God's people lived. So there was darkness there. there they, people couldn't see. They couldn't even see each other. They, they didn't know what to do, but there was light among the people of God. Do you recognize that God has set you in the middle of darkness because you are to be the exception. You are to be the light. Man, that's good news. It's good news to know. One translation says there was darkness in all of Egypt, but there was land in Go uh, light in Goshen. And, and Goshen was the land in which the Israelites lived in Egypt. So, so it's like darkness everywhere, but he still can shine his light on you right in the middle of darkness. And see, we don't read this and, and think, well, that means that for us to be an exception, we're not going to go through anything bad at all. No, because God tells us we're going to go through difficult times. We're going to go through bad times sometimes. But the outcome is different when you're a child of God. That you can go through difficulty, but you don't have to come out of it the same way everyone else comes out of it. In fact, I talked to many people this last week uh, who are just so thankful that 2018 is in the past. How many of you are glad that we are in a new year? Yeah. <laughs> like, woohoo! Like, praise Jesus, that's in the past. Because... For a lot of people, we went through some difficulty in 2018. 
I mean, there were some tough times. There was some struggle. It was just, it, it was just faithfulness, just maintain and just keep on keeping on because we're going through some struggle, going so, through some difficult time. And this morning, my wife, as we were worshiping in the first service and praying, she felt like she was hearing from God that God was telling us that he used in this last year. And you need to hear this if your 2018 was difficult. He used the pressure and the time of this 2018 in order to be able to refine you into something new. He made a diamond out of you because what happens with the diamond right pressure and time squeezes down on coal long enough to where it transforms something that, that that is worthless into something that is powerful and beautiful and precious and has so much worth and that is exactly what God is doing to you and I James 1, 2 says that, that we should rejoice anytime trials and tribulation come upon us because God uses those difficulties in order to be able to strengthen our perseverance and grow us in our faith. So God has used 2018 and you go, oh my gosh, it's been difficult. Well, it's difficult for everyone. Okay, we've all gone through difficulty. The difference is that you and I are the exception. Because he takes the same difficulty that everyone else went through and what he does with it is he can use it to refine you and to change you. Why? Because you're the exception. And we see this principle all throughout scripture that, that God expects his people to, to be the exception. But 90 year old women, they don't have babies, right? But God, <laughs> got someone down here, thank God for that, right? <laughs> But God made an exception for Sarah. Like, we, we got to recognize that waters don't just part so people can walk through. But God made an exception for Moses and the people of Israel. Walls don't just fall down because someone screamed at them. But God made an exception for Joshua and, and the Israelites as they walked around Jericho. See, uh, people don't just die and lay in the ground for three days and then get up early on Sunday morning. But God made an exception for Jesus. And why is this important that we start to recognize this? Because if God will make an exception for Sarah, and if he, if he will make an exception for Moses, and if he will make an exception for Joshua, and he makes an exception for Jesus and raises him from the dead, you know what that means? He can make an exception for you. So what you and I can't do is we can't go through life looking at all the reasons that we've just got to fit into society and just go with the norm. We've got to look at the fact that, wait a minute, if God has chosen me, if he's called me to follow him and be his own, he doesn't expect me to look like everyone else. He expects me to be the exception. So I am the exception. I am the exception. I hope, man, I hope you will embrace that and start declaring that over your own life, that, that 2019 is going to be the exception, and I am the exception to the rule. In fact, say, say that, declare it over your life. The most important person that speaks to you is you. So I want to encourage you, say that over yourself right now. Say, I am the exception. I am the exception. I know what normal is, but this isn't normal. I know the way things ordinary go, but this is not ordinary. I am the exception. And there is a word that we're going to use over the month of January as we're in this series to talk about people who have embraced this principle of exception. In those people, we are going to call affectionately water walkers. Because a water walker uh, is abnormal, right? Because walking is found all throughout Scripture. Walking isn't abnormal. In fact, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that we see talk about walking. In fact, Genesis starts off talking about Jesus walking through the garden. Right? Moses walked through the Red Sea. Joshua walked around Jericho. The disciples walked on the road to Emmaus. Jesus walked down the road of suffering before he was crucified. Scripture is filled with walking. Walking on the ground isn't abnormal. But in Matthew 14, you and I are introduced to something that's a little bit different. Because in Matthew 14, we see two men who, who are walking, but they're not walking on the ground. We see two men in Matthew 14 who are walking on water. Two men who are walking on something that most people drowned in at the time. So 
what we see here is we see Jesus walking on water and we go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. He's the son of God, God incarnate. He is all powerful. He can do whatever he wants to do. Of course, he could command the water to hold him up. Of course, he can do whatever he wants to do. It makes sense that Jesus is walking on water, but there's another guy. And this, this other guy we see in scripture, he's got some issues. This other guy, we, we see that he's moody. He's very temperamental. Uh, it's a man by the name of Peter. And Peter is a guy that the Bible describes as someone who would lay hands on you and pray for you and anoint you. But he's also someone who might just throw those hands at you and hit you in the face. He's that type of a guy. And I think you can understand that because we're a room full of people who, who we get that. It's like sometimes I feel like I'm praising God, I'm loving him, I'm doing everything right. And other days it's like I've lost my stinking mind, right? Like I know that I'm not perfect and I love looking at Peter here because was Peter perfect? No, he was just as jacked up as you and me. <laughs> and I love looking at this story because we see jacked up Peter and jacked up Peter is walking on water. Wait a minute. That means it, excuse me. So if he doesn't have it all right, if he's not, if he doesn't have perfect attendance at church and he's not always obeying God and he cusses sometimes and he hits people like, wait, how in the world does he get miracles? Like that, that means I could get a miracle too. And man, I love looking at stories where, where God uses ordinary jacked up people like you and I, because it's so encouraging to know that you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. In fact, he chooses to use people who aren't perfect because when he uses people who aren't perfect, then everyone goes, wait a minute, you had nothing to do with that. That was all God. And he gets the credit. And I don't, I don't need any credit for anything. So I can be the jacked up dude that God uses. Let's do that. Like, I, I want God to make miracles out of my life and I don't need any credit for it. Let's just point the credit towards him, right? And I think, I think that's something we can pull out of the scripture here is that, that God is using a jacked up man to teach us a principle that, man, we don't want to miss how much we can pull away from this. Because if we jump forward into verse 22, it says this. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Immediately. Immediately after what? Well, this story comes immediately after the miracle of Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Well, it was a lot more than that actually because they only counted the men at the time. So there was 5,000 men in attendance where Jesus fed them and no one had food except for a little boy who had two uh, uh, loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And he took that and did a huge miracle out of it. Miracle that, that we could pull so many principles out of, so many truths out of about God's love for us. And how he takes and blesses us. Like we see in this passage, here's some truths from the feeding of the 5,000. Number one, we need to understand we can learn that God won't multiply what we don't release. That the little boy had to let go of his resources. He had to let go of what he had before God multiplied it. The second truth we can pull from it is God can send overwhelming blessings from unexpected places. Okay, this little boy, he wasn't even counted. And the count for the miracle, the little boy is not even accounted for in that count. Because no one expected anything cool to come from a little child that, that, that snuck out there to hear Jesus. Free. No, they, God uses unexpected places for miracles to come from. Number three, someone's miracle can be contingent upon our generosity. People were only blessed there because the little boy said, yeah, you can take and use what I have. The, uh, the fourth principle we get from this is that God doesn't have to add to us to increase us. He many times can give you addition by division. Maybe in 2018, you were praying for God to give you more. And maybe in 2019, he wants to show you how to use what you have and do more with it. And then the fifth thing we pull from this is that our limitations only limit us when we let them. Okay, because there, here's this whole principle of exception here. Immediately after this, Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him and he doesn't go with them. Okay, so after this miracle is over, I want you guys to go, get in the boat and go and, and go over to the other side. And they knew, like, of course, this wouldn't be their preference. They wanted Jesus to be with them, but they knew they were going to run into him again. Why? Because they obeyed where he went. And anytime you're on the path of obedience, you're going to run back into God. Anytime you're doing what he's asking you to do, that's where you're going to run smack dab into the presence of God. It's like, how did they know they were going to find the presence of God again? Well, they just did what he told them to do. 
I want you to go to the other side. And maybe God is telling you to do something that might seem weird. And you're wondering like, how, how am I gonna know? Well, is as you obey him, you will continue to run into him. So we see that he sent them across to the other side. And this would have been unnerving for the disciples. Their preference would have been that Jesus would have stayed with them. But the Bible says Jesus went on by himself. It says after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. In fact, I want everyone uh, to repeat these two words with me, please. By himself. You guys are repeating great with me. I'm going to challenge you guys right now. Let's try that again. By himself. He went off by himself. Why? Well, because maybe Jesus is teaching us in this passage that in order to be able to help them, he might have had to put some space between himself and them. And I think that's a difficult thing for us to understand. Sometimes we're too close. Sometimes we need to take a step back. Sometimes we need to put some space between ourselves and those people that have been pulling so much from us, have been just drawing from us and drawing from us. Because we see here that the Bible says that he went off to pray by himself. A water walker understands when it's time to get refueled and replenished through prayer. Okay, because it says after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them walking on the lake. So don't miss this. The miracle of feeding the 5,000 people ended the evening before. And then Jesus sent the disciples off that night to go off in the boat alone. He's off by himself praying, right? So they get a head start on where they're going. And we don't know how long exactly, but the Bible says sometime before dawn. So we're talking several hours head start. They are, they're rowing their boat. They're doing everything they can to get the sails going right. They're going against the wind. So they're just rowing and sweating and putting forth so much energy and so much effort in order to be able to move forward. And then get this, after Jesus has been away praying all night long, it says shortly before dawn, he just walks to them, right? Like they worked all night long, strive all of them together, working as hard as they can. And he just simply walks out to them because when a person understands the power of refueling and refocusing through prayer, they understand that prayer allows me to get there faster. Man, in 2019, I hope you will embrace that as you have been striving so hard and you are, you're, you're hiring people to bring more to the table and you're working harder and you're putting forth so much more effort. But maybe if we stop and we refuel and we pray and we get right in line with what God wants, he's gonna allow us to get where we've been trying to get so much faster with so much less energy than we've been spending for year after year after year. Prayer will allow you to get there faster. Man, Jesus is walking and he comes up on the disciples and, and they're terrified. Ah, it's a ghost. And he's like, guys, come down. It's me. Take a look at me. Think about this for a minute. Jesus is their mentor, right? They live with Jesus. They, they know him. They know his voice. They've seen him walk. They, they've heard. They, they know who Jesus is, but they don't recognize him because they're in the middle of the storm and they are scared. Maybe this is pointed out in this passage because sometimes it's hard to see Jesus when you're in the middle of a storm. Sometimes when you're going through difficulty, God can show up in an unexpected way and we miss the fact that he shows up in an unexpected way. Because you realize God doesn't always show up the way that you would write the story. Like, we all have our perfect way. I want God to bless me this way and that way and this way and that way. And, and when it doesn't work out that way, sometimes we miss the way that God really does show up. Because we pray that God would give us increase and he'd bless us. And when we do get blessings, we go, oh, look, God blessed me. We can recognize him there. But what about the times when God shows up and, and he gives you decrease? What about the times when he shows up and he provides for you when there's less? What, what, what about the times when we expect God to show up and open doors of opportunities? But what about the times he shows up and close them? It's still God. I wonder, are we missing the way that God's showing up because we're expecting him to show up a certain way? No one expected Jesus to show up the way he did, but, 
But he showed up and they were, they were talking, oh my gosh. And when they finally realized it was him, remember there's 12 of them in the boat. 12 students, 12 people who they, they know Jesus, but they believe he's the son of God. They, they, they're following him, they're trusting him, and they see Jesus walking on water. And out of 12, just one, only one, a man named Peter looks out there and says, hey, I want to do that too. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Like, if you could do that, I want to do that. Like, I don't care what these other jokers do in the boat. I want to go, like, if, if you are teaching me how to live my life, Jesus, and you're walking on water, then I want to walk on water. So it's like, do, this is where we see the principle of exception. Okay, do you see it here where, where Peter is in the midst of a group of guys, and this group of guys are good guys. They love Jesus. They love Peter. He loves them. He's not saying I'm better than you guys or anything like that, but, but he, he's going, I, I don't care what's going on with them. I, I want what God can do for me. And if you guys aren't going to ask him to let you come out on the water, I'm going to ask him to let me come out on the water because I want everything he has for me. See, Peter had the gall and the nerve and the audacity to say, it doesn't matter what happens with you guys. I'm not going to let your experience dictate or determine what my experience will be. So I want the most of what God has for me. And church family, that's what I'm praying for us, uh, that, that we would be a, a church that, that we are exceptional, that we want everything that God has for us, and we go after everything that he has for us. See, he didn't allow what happened to the others to hinder what was going to happen for him. So he stepped out of the boat, and he followed Jesus' words, and he walked on water, it makes me ask the question, it begs me to ask the question, who are your 11? Who are the other people in your life that you're, you look at in order to determine what is possible for you? I think it's something very important for us to look at going into this new year, so, to stop for a moment, hit the pause button, go, I, have I been categorizing myself and only expecting that I can do what others around me can do? And maybe it's other people that are in the same line of work as you. And you're, you're going, listen, other people, they're only experiencing this amount of success and this amount uh, of failure right now. So I should be somewhere in line with them. And I know the market is different in Denver than the way it is here. It's different in Phoenix than the way it is here. And we like make comparisons off of other people. Maybe it's the people you, you live with, your family or your friends. Are you saying just because uh, of the way other people live, like because of the experience of the 11, that's what I would expect is the most I can get out of my own life? Are you being categorized? Because that happens to us where we get categorized maybe into an age group where, where you think you're too old for that or you're too young for this or you need to get more of an education before you move on and try that or because no woman has ever made it that far in that industry before. Maybe you look at the experience of the other 11 and think that that's what has to categorize you and determine whether or not you're gonna be able to be successful and move forward. But thank God in this story, we see a man with the gall, the nerve and the audacity to say, I love you guys, you're awesome. I'm, I'm not judging you, but I'm not, I'm not comfortable just staying stuck in the boat with you. I'm not gonna allow what happens to you to determine what can happen to me because I serve a God who wants me to be an exception. So I'm gonna move forward in my life. I'm not, like, it's, and there was no, it's not like he was judging the other 11. It's not like he was saying there's any problem with it. No, because this principle, principle of being an exception should lead to humility, not arrogance. That we go, okay, there, there's nothing wrong with you being comfortable staying in the boat, but I wasn't made for the boat. I wasn't made to just sit, like I suffocate in a place called comfortable. I suffocate in a place called safe. You know, I need to go try to get whatever God has for me. If I stay stuck in this boat, I'm gonna eventually start rocking this boat because you might be fine being the 11 who are safe in the boat, but I'm a number 12. I'm the exception. And church, you need to understand that Fellowship Church is an exceptional church. That we're not going to look to the successes or failures of other people of whether or not God can bless us here. We're not going to look to whether or not our economy is doing good or whether or not uh, our economy is doing bad. We are going to look to see, God, is there something you want us to do? Because we don't care what's on the news and we don't care what your aunt said. And I don't care what is going on with my brother or my sister. What I want is I want to know, God, if you'll let me walk on water, then I want to walk on water. So I have no judgment for them, but I'm not them. 
So church family, do you understand? You are to be the exception. You, you are to live an exceptional life. And just because there was addiction in your family doesn't mean that's gonna determine what has to happen for you. And just because th there's been one marriage after another that's failed doesn't mean that you have to let the enemy get a hold of your marriage. We can be the exception. We can be water walkers. And guys, that, that's the term we're using here is I, I wanna be a water walker. And as we jump into this, um, going into the month of January, we're gonna dive into this in a lot more depth. But before I dismiss you today, I wanna give you three things that we all need in order to be able to become water walkers. The first thing is we need exposure. We need exposure. We need to see what is available to us. Peter, we know, is a fisherman by trade. He spent his entire life on the water. Like, he, morning, noon, and night, he was on the water. And the Bible never says, there's no account of Peter trying to walk on water before until he saw Jesus do it. So, he was exposed to the fact that if my Savior can do it, if I'm following Jesus and he can do it, then that means that's available to me as well. And I wonder, what is it that you're being exposed to right now? Are, are you seeing success in other people's lives? Because you realize God doesn't expose things because once you've been exposed to something, you can never be unexposed. And when God exposes to you that success is available to you, that health is available to you, that, that good, strong relationships are available to you, that freedom from addiction is available to you, when he shows you these things, he's not showing you something just to say, look, you can't have it. No, but maybe we start to recognize exposure is actually a sign of the favor of God. Because if God is exposing you to, to what is available to you, he, he's trying to make something grow in you to where you're not gonna be content just sitting in the boat for the rest of your life. But you're gonna go, I want everything he has for me. And if I see that your marriage is strong, I don't want your marriage. I'm not gonna covet after that. What I want is I want God to bless my marriage. And if he can give you dreams and plans and goals that help your business, then I believe he can do the same thing for me. So I wonder, what are you being exposed to? Is God starting to show you that, that there's more, that, that there's more available to you? And, and I know that this is the part where it becomes uncomfortable because we go, it's so, it's so much easier to just sit in the boat. But maybe God is showing you things because he wants to build in you a, a passion, right? Like there, there's what the, many people call a holy discontent. And, and what we hope and we pray for is that God would use his anointing over Fellowship Church in order to be able to irritate you in certain ways. Every time you come into this place that you would be irritated that there's more for you that you could have success, that you can move forward, that, that there could be changes in your life, that, that you become discontent with just the norm, just discontent with just being comfortable when you could have everything that he wants for you. But we see here that for Peter to become a water walker, not only was he exposed to the fact that it was available to him, we see the th second thing is that Peter received an invitation and that's the second thing you need in order to be able to become a water walker is an invitation. Even though Peter had an appetite for walking on the sea, he didn't leave until Jesus invited him to. In church family, this is so important. His walking in the, on the water was not based off of his ambition or his passion. He didn't just dive in the water as soon as he saw Jesus come. He wanted to know, is this something that's even available to me? And I'm not gonna try it because it's impossible to walk on the water, but... If it's available to me, Jesus is going to ask me to do it. And we see that what happened here is he said, okay, so Jesus, is this something that's available to me? And, 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 and Jesus said, come. And Peter then stepped out, being obedient to the word of God, to come to him, and he began walking. And as we look in this story, and we really break it down, that he didn't even attempt it until God told him to, we recognize that Peter wasn't walking on water so much as he was walking on a word. That he wasn't walking on water just to walk on water. He was walking on water to get to Jesus. That this story is all about his obedience. That he wasn't going to try something just to try something. He wasn't chasing adrenaline. 
You know, he wasn't just being crazy. He's going, if this is something that's available to me, God will lead me in that direction. And and, and God said, come to him. So he decided, I'm going to go ahead and be obedient. And maybe he stepped out of the boat and he was walking on obedience. Maybe he's going, if this is available to me and God's telling me to do it, then you know what? Uh, Maybe his fear of staying stuck in the boat was greater than his fear of anything that was unknown out in front of him now. Why? Because Jesus simply said, come. And church family, I got to tell you, and I, and I so hope and I pray that every person will take this to heart and hear this for you as an individual. This is why it's so important that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That you are hearing what God is inviting you to do. That, that you are hearing exactly what it is that he wants you to do on every day because we see that, that just having a good idea of doing something cool is not good enough. Because when, when we look all the way back to Exodus, when, when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt, it, we see that God parted the Red Sea. He said, I want you to wave your staff over the ocean and the waters will part. They parted and he said, now go. So they went, walked through the divided Red Sea. They walked through on dry ground. And while they're doing this, Pharaoh showed up with his armies. And, and, and they see the Israelites are moving through the Red Sea. And, and Pharaoh gets this idea, well, if they can do it, I can do it. After all, I have more horses, I have more chariots, I have more degrees, I have more titles. I have so much more than they have. So anything that they can do, I certainly can do. And they decided to go through the Red Sea, even though God did not tell them to. And Pharaoh and his armies drowned in the Red Sea. And they drowned because you drown when you try to walk through on a word that God didn't give you, but he gave to somebody else. So church family, we can't just go through life and go, yeah, well, it's neat. I saw them do it. So I'm gonna... No, no, God has a plan for you. I have plans uh, to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope in the future. He has plans for you. So you can't live your life trying to live off his plans for me or his plans for anyone else. You've got to live your life understanding that every day he will tell you what to do and he will invite you what to do. And then what he does is he, he asks you to do some things that don't make any sense at all. And, and that's one of the ways you know it's God. Because <laughs> if you could just do it on your own, what you're doing, you're just walking through life on your own. But sometimes God will ask you to do things that don't make any sense. He said, come. And Peter's like, okay, it doesn't make sense to anyone else in this boat, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to come. I'm going to trust Jesus and do it anyways. I'm going to step out onto the water. And everyone else could have been like, hey, that doesn't make any sense. Like, what? if you step in that water, you're going to go straight down. You're going to drown. Like, like, we're not getting in there after you. It's cold. So don't do that. <laughs> like, and how often does God tell us to do things and the people around us are going, that doesn't make any sense. Why did you be giving all that time at the church? Like, you're already there on Sundays, and now you're going to start volunteering on Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights? Like, seriously? Like, that doesn't make any sense. How are you going to do that with your schedule? You're going to, you're going to start giving your, your money um, at the church? Why would you do that? Why would you trust God? It doesn't make any sense. But you're going, no, listen, you don't understand. I heard the voice of my Heavenly Father speak to me, and he said, come. And, and that's what he'll do is he will start to tell you to do things that don't make sense to anyone else. But when we we just trust him and we take the next step, we do the third thing that every water walker must do, and that's have initiative. See, Peter heard Jesus say, come, but Peter was the one that had to step out of the boat and walk. See, God will invite you to do things, but but he's not going to move your legs for you. He'll invite you to serve, but he's not going to sign up the paper for you. He'll invite you to give, but he's not going to open up your wallet for you. We're going to have to trust him and take the initiative to do some things that don't make any sense. And I think the reason why so many people get stuck, because the truth is, a, a lot of people hear God invite them to do things. And because it doesn't make sense, we're comfortable not doing anything. The word come from God is not enough. Because we're like, I just don't know. I don't understand. And so many people are still stuck today in the same place they were stuck a year ago and five years ago and 10 years ago because the word come from your heavenly father was not enough. And he's just saying, come, just trust me. And we're going, but wait a minute. And, and I'm, not, I'm not harping on anyone because I can tell you I struggle with this too. Going, it doesn't make sense to me. Like explain to me, if I step under that water, is it going to be cold? Is the wind going to blow? 
Like, if, if I get out there and it splashes on my face, am I gonna be, is it going to be slippery? How am I going to have traction out there on this water? This doesn't even make sense. Like, you got to explain it to me. And we start trying to figure out, well, well God, how, I don't know. Am I going to have to cancel so much of my schedule? Am I going to have to take a different job in order to be able to volunteer? Am I going to, like, that doesn't even make sense. So how am I going to forgive that person? What is actually going to happen? Are people going to think I'm crazy if I forgive that person? And we start asking all these questions. And Jesus is like, just come. But God, what, what, if, what if I start serving and they don't like me? Just come. But, but what if I give and, and then I, I don't have enough at the end of the month? And he's, just come. But, but, but what if I forgive them and, and then I don't have anything to hold on to anymore? And, 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 and am I letting them off the hook? And just come. See, your heavenly father will invite you to do things many times, and, and this is what I want you to hear, is the life of faith is a simple life. Because a lot of times we, we try to ask all the questions, and if I can just understand it, then I'll trust God. And we see in this story, he never explains to Peter how it worked. He didn't say, okay, since I created the waters, when I speak my voice out and you step out in faith, the water is going to respond to my voice and hold you up and keep you dry. Like, he never explains any of these things. He's just like, just come. And, and guys, a life of faith is a simple life. I have a, a friend who I've been in a small group with, and his name's Justin, and he said something almost apologetically one day um, in our small group that, man, it stuck with me, and I started praying it over my own life and praying it over my family and praying it over every one of you in our church, is, is that he, he just one day apologetically is like, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I just have a simple faith. Like, what do you mean by that? He goes, I, I, don't, I don't even understand how it all works, but God said to do it, and I trust him, so I'm just going to do it. It's pretty simple. <laughs> That's what I want. That's what I want for my life. That's what I, I pray for your life as well, is that you and I would be the type of people that have a simple faith. That we stop, like, is it wrong to ask God questions? No. But is it wrong to stay stuck in the boat because we have to have all the answers first? Yes. Because he calls us to step forward and move forward and just come to me. And if, are we going to live the rest of our lives sitting in the boat going, as soon as you explain it, then, then maybe I'll do something when he's going. No, you're like, you can be the example of how I can bless people if you'll just come. It's so much more simple than that. And church family, I believe that this year is an opportunity. Because I believe for so many of us, we've heard the invitation from God that we've been exposed to the blessings in other people's lives. We've heard the invitation deep within our soul. We've heard down, down in our spirit, we've heard where God is saying, I want you to give. I want you to trust me. I want you to serve. I want you to pray over that coworker. You've heard the invitations. You've gone, it doesn't make sense. And guys, if we take the initiative and we step out in a simple faith, we'll begin walking on water. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person in this room, and I believe that this month you want to transform the way that we interact with you, that you want to take um, our actions and make them just come right in line with following you. So thank you, God, that you've exposed us to the fact that the blessings are possible. Thank you, God, that uh, you've invited us to follow you, and I pray that um, for every person in this room, we would listen to what you want us to do on a daily basis. We would pray, we would listen to you, we'd read your word so that we know exactly what it is you're calling each of us to do individually. And then God, we pray that we would have the courage to take the initiative to do what you call us to do. So God, I pray you'd help us this month, help us to learn and grow, to be people of faith who are able to become water walkers, God, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message at Fellowship Church. If you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. The Bible says in the book of Romans, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. You can do that right now. I just wanna encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that you are Lord, that you died on a cross for my sins, and that you rose again. And God, I thank you for that. I ask you now to be my Savior, to guide my life, and to give me a home forever in heaven. 
And God, I ask you this in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, or if you need prayer, we would love to hear from you. You can contact us at 970-245-PRAY or at prayer at fellowshipgj.com. Thanks again. We hope to see you next week.